Okay, so well, thank you all for coming. Um, so we are part of the South Bay Gig yes. uh, Geographic Interest Group, which is a, a part of the Golden Gate chapter at ASTU. And we have uh, different events that happen. So if you look at the back of your name tag, we have the next four events that are coming up. So as you leave today, we'll recycle the, the covers, but keep your name tag so you have uh, the next events that are coming up. And we have a very exciting thing that we're working on right now, which is a special interest group, which Veronica can talk a little bit about. Um, okay, before I talk about that, though, uh, look at your little pieces of paper. Where there are plenty of uh, that have been passed out on the table. Lots of volunteer opportunities that might only be a couple hours a week. And we'd love your program ideas. And then if you have great connections to people you think would make great presenters, uh, please, please fill that out. Um, we want to keep growing this group and offering programs that are really helpful to you in your, in your work. Uh, now, we are about to launch a special interest group, a SIG, that's going to be probably the first uh, in the country of its kind. Uh, it's, called, it's on innovation in learning and development. And we're going to try to set it up as sort of a sandbox or a laboratory sort of group where you can actually do some experimentation, maybe some you know, field uh, projects if you'd like to do that, action learning projects. But how many of y'all have heard of Lance Dublin? Okay. Yeah, very, you know, he's, I guess he's a rock star in the ASTD community, but uh, he's put out a challenge. A couple of us went to a, a Mount Diablo ASTD program uh, three, four months ago where he put a challenge out to the, to the training and development community about Addy. He said, yeah, Addy works, but is there more? Are we kind of stuck in a box? You know, are there, are there other ways or other, uh, you know, there's lean, there's, there's agile, there's business process or you know, realignment, there's, there's uh, human performance technology. They're all concerned with performance improvement. They're all concerned with learning. And they have similar, you know, they use analysis and design and implementation and evaluation, but maybe some different order, different, you know, different steps. Is there anything we can learn? So anyway, we're going to sort of, we're, we're stepping up to the challenge, the first group in the country, supposedly, to actually have people coming from those communities, and uh, we're going to experiment around with some, uh, some scenarios and things like that. We're also going to look at things like Socrates cafes in workplaces, maybe do some hands-on with flipped classroom. So that we're looking at uh, the September 25th or 6th. We haven't quite nailed down the date, but... Uh, we're really excited about that, so please keep your ears, uh, <coughs> keep listening in. Okay. Great, and also, so each one of these events takes an incredible amount of work, so I would just like to say thank you to all of the volunteers, so Angel, um, Christina, and Troy, I just want to say thank you so much for... We actually have some people here who are part of the core team. Can you just raise your hand? Great, okay. thank you very much, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious, how many of you are members if you could, of ASTD? Wonderful. And how many of you would like to be members? <laughs> so, I just want you to know that this gig is part of the Golden Gate chapter, which is in San Francisco. That might be a long ways for you, but the one of the things that they've been doing, and, and Troy has been also helpful with this, is that they've actually been able to offer some of their meetings virtually. So they just started that and they're actually even refining the whole process so it's, it's easier to get in and listen to um, some of their workshops. They have incredible, we, we attract really incredible um, folks in the Valley. So please consider joining us. Not only that, once you become a member of Golden Gate, you have access to this club and also the North the North Bay, right? So you have almost like three groups that you can go visit. So if you have any questions, please let me know. If you are thinking about being a member, go in and, and to the website and look at the membership. And we also offer a special membership for students. I don't know if there's any students here. 
Okay, great. You're welcome. And if you have any questions about membership, mm -hmm. Angel, you can grab her. Right. All right, thank you. So now, Trish, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Well, I, I, I don't believe in introductions, which is why poor Varsha was like, what should I say about you? I said, don't say anything. If they like the presentation, they'll be interested in who I am. If they don't like the presentation, they won't care who it is that I am. And that makes absolutely perfect sense. So there's a little bit of my bio information in the handouts, which I'll get to in just a second, but I'm very excited to be here. And we got a little stalled out for a moment there, so I want to make sure that we return to it can we have a round of applause for your volunteers? That <laughs> so there are 125 ASTD chapters across the country, and to be able to have a program like this, they're all volunteer boards. Is there anybody here from the board of directors for Mount Alabla? Mount, or uh, for Golden Gate. Golden Gate? Excellent. So Alan is here. And then could we have the core members just rise again, please, from and the board? Please, thank you. It's in the competency model. It's in the competency model. We're going to talk a lot about the ACD competency model this evening. Uh, I'm actually here from Chicago. I am a past president, serve on the board of directors for the Chicagoland chapter of ASTD. We are one of the oldest. And well, we're one of the oldest, is really what it's all about. Uh, so I've served eight years on the board there. Uh, and I travel around the world and actually help people operationalize the ASTD competency model. So learning professionals such as yourselves. And I do an awful lot lately around gamification. And let me tell you a little bit why. All right, take a look at your handouts if you would please. Here's why. Very first cover page here, competencies and the specific skills. Competencies and the specific skills. Now when we talk about competency models and we talk about skills, let's go easy. This is a softball pitch to my learning professional peers. What is a competency? Actually, let me even go higher up. What's a competency model? Why do we care? Uh. Ellen. I was hoping somebody else would be able to answer. Uh, a competency model is a view of what uh, a professional needs to do and know in order to be a professional in their field. Thank you, Alan. Fabulous. Excellent. And then, so what is a competency? So competency models have competencies. What's a competency? Skills. 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 Yeah. Mastery. Yep. It, um, uh, it could be, uh, maybe not mastery, it could it it set us up for mastery, it would set us up for a base level of competency, correct, thank you. So skills and then also knowledge and attitudes, yeah? So what do we usually call those? K? Sing along with me now. I'm untethered, I can come to you, and I will. What do we call those? KSAs. KSAs. And where does that come from? What's the, what's the model? Bloom. Bloom. Bloom's taxonomy, yeah? Okay, KSAs. All right, now, here's the reason why everybody in this room should care about the ACD competency model. You ready? It's also going to be, it's going to be a soft pitch. It's considered by the United States Department of Labor as the professional standard to define the competencies, the KSAs for this profession in the United States. That makes us literally, I do not use the word lightly, it makes us literally a profession rather than an occupation. Now, let me ask you, what do you think of when you think of a profession versus an occupation? Different? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. How is it different? Classy. Classic. Classic. Better paid. Better paid. Better paid. What else? Upward mobility. Upward mobility. What else? Career versus job. Career versus job. Excellent. So let me ask you this. I'm going to call myself out here. 22 years ago, I started as an accidental trainer, fell into this field, fell into this field, and fell in love with the profession that is learning and performance. Do I have peers in the room? Never formally educated in this particular space, yeah? Okay, kind of found a passion, or at least you're kind of playing around, enough to come out on a Tuesday night, right, to kind of learn a little something, something more about it. Okay, fabulous. How many people here have formal education somewhere in learning and performance? Training and development, learning and performance? Fabulous. 
And that's a relatively new, that's relatively new, right? I didn't, I didn't grow up and go to high school and decide that one day I was gonna be a corporate trainer. I didn't decide one day that I was gonna go to high school and become a software, a software specialist or a software trainer. Those things just kinda happen. I graduated high school in the 1980s. Computers were just starting to come into the schools and just starting to come into the office spaces. So the jobs, the jobs that I've had around information technology and around learning and performance didn't exist when I graduated high school in 1987. How many people here are working a job that didn't exist when you graduated high school? Yeah, look around the room. Accelerate. Accelerate. So competency model defines the professional standard for learning and performance. There is a certification that's based on it. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation today. I don't think everybody in the world needs to get CPLP certified, which is a certified professional in learning and performance. It means that you are voluntarily assessed against the professional standard that is the competency model. But I believe everybody in this room should have an understanding of what the competency model is, and if for nothing else, how it can serve as a professional development roadmap for you so you can continue to get good at your game as time goes on. So that being said, right there on the very front of the page, the actual skills and competencies, right? So the skills from the different competencies within the competency model are actually listed right there on the page. And I'll put the competency model back up in a second. So the skills that we're going to touch on today are actually listed right there. You're going to need them. There's going to be an activity. Just saying, heads up. All right? OK. Second page. A little bit of information about the Certified Professional in Learning and Performance, the CPLP certification from AST. Again, right now it's voluntary. Usually those types of qualifications take about 10 years to go mainstream. It just turned seven years old operationally this year in July. It's coming soon where hiring managers are going to be looking for this on a regular basis. Next page after that, third page, the ideas worksheet, right? and an action plan on the back. Ideas worksheet and an action plan on the back. This is your job aid and your tool for today to make sure that what you gain from tonight's session, you're able to take out of this room and carry forward. You're able to take out of this room and carry forward. So that page, page number three, that's got the uh, applying the competency model to your professional development idea worksheet, it's meant to, as we go through the material tonight, the skills on the first page, whatever resonates with you, and you go, oh, wait a minute, I really need to get better at that. I really need to improve my KSAs with that. You've got a place in order to frame it up. And then oftentimes, oftentimes, we need more information or we need to connect with somebody, right, before we can actually put something into action. And so that's what the action plan on the very back of your handout is all about. So in order for you to do the things that you list on the competency model worksheet for your own professional development plan, what other, act, what other actions do you need to take in order to be successful in moving those forward? Fair enough? Good? <coughs> okay. Team Handy. Learning redefined, gamification. Just a little bit about me, about today's session. We're gonna start with a baseline. We're gonna start with a baseline. We're gonna talk today about what gamification is and what gamification is not. We're gonna talk about why it matters. I'm gonna show you again specifically how it ties to those skills and competencies in the NICD competency model. We're going to talk about where it is that everybody in this room needs to go from here in order to make sure that you're incorporating some element of this stuff in your work moving forward. And I'm going to show you specifically how to get started. Specifically how to get started. Okay? Anybody know who this is? <laughs> who is that? Bumblebee. Bumblebee. What's a bumblebee? The transformer. The transformer. Excellent. And what's a transformer? It's a robot in disguise. It's a robot. <laughs> That's most excellent. Thank you, Mr. Montague. What What does the robot in disguise, the transformer, do? 
What's that? Changes from an ordinary machine to something amazing. Changes from the ordinary machine for to, to become something amazing, usually under what kinds of circumstances? Evil. 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 There's evil afoot in the world. But there's some challenge that's being presented, right? Somebody's not able to do something, something's happening somewhere, and so the transformers come out and they actually cause transformation. Disruptive transformation oftentimes. There's car chases and all sorts of uh, things that are happening with buildings and whatnot. So the transformers are about disruption and about transformation. Time is now. And the reason I'm here tonight is because I'm about transformation and disruption in learning and performance because I have a big, hairy, audacious goal. Anybody ever see a bag before? B-H-A-G? All right. Big, hairy, audacious goal. This is my big, hairy, audacious goal. To travel the world and help my learning and performance professionals, including myself, my peers in the industry, to transform. So why transformation and not innovation? We keep hearing about innovate, innovate, innovate. Why would I use the word like transformation instead of innovation? More flexible. More flexible? Okay. What else? Because it's change. Because it's change? It doesn't throw out what's already there. It doesn't throw out what innovation exactly does not throw out what's already there. Innovation implies changing what is. Transformation is creating what's new. It's a whole new ballgame as of 2001. Whole new economy as of 2008. Whole new set of globalization and global politics, 2008. Times they are changing, they continue to change. We're creating what's new. We're creating what's new for the 21st century, and we're a little late as a profession to the game. That's okay. I want to talk a little bit about where we came from and where we need to go next, just to give you some context, right, and make sure that I, I ground you in some familiarity. So we'll start with this. Anybody? Duran Duran fan? 1980s? Right? I've been trying to get Simon Le Bon to be linked in with me. Right? Okay. Facebook, side of the bottom. So this is me. Pietrish. This is what? I said I'm Pietrish. <laughs> a little crazy on the social media. So this is me rocking my Duran Duran shirt. I'm probably about 14 years old. Okay? Rocking. Totally rocking my Duran Duran shirt. And these are the games that I started out playing. Yeah. What is that? Does anybody know what that is? Pong! Pong! And how did you play Pong? Very slowly. Very slowly. <laughs> Very slowly. I used to beat my father at this game like crazy. And the only reason was because I would just sit there like this and wait. And he just couldn't stand it. How did we play Pong? What did we play Pong on? The TV. The TV. And what did our, did our TVs look like the LCD flat panels that we have today? <laughs> They were the cabinets, the console TVs that you had to actually get up and cross the room. How many people remember this? Console TVs, right? How many people play Pong? All right, I'm a Thank you, Silicon Valley. Can I tell you how many places I go and people are like, what are you talking about? All right, let's try this one. Anybody? What's that? Oh. Oh. What is that? Pitfall. From what? Atari. Atari! Atari, excellent, thank you. And we used to, this was like when we started getting graphics, right? When we started getting, so we went from this into this, Atari. This is like pre-Nintendo. This is what we had as images, right? We had, a, we had a complete, it was an adventure game. We had a, you know, it was basically the hero's journey. You played a character that had complete these challenges, all right? This is my background, guys. Ready for the next one? I'm in Silicon Valley. I'm hoping. What's this? Oh. Anybody? Infocom? I've got the box set. Anniversary box set. Anybody here? I've got the t-shirt. Ultima One. Solved it. <laughs> Sent in the screenshot. Got the t-shirt. Zork. 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 Text-based game on the computer, yeah? 
Another adventure game, text-based. Excellent. Games. Games, games, games. And these are the people I played games with. They would be so delighted. I still know them all today. 31 years we've been together playing games. Still play games today. And we live in all different parts of the country. All different parts of the country. And we still play games today. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we do that every third Friday. Every third Friday, we get together, those of us that are in town and can come, we get together and play games. Now, who here plays games? Board games, video games, okay? Who do you play games with? Friends. Friends? Who else do you play games with? Okay. Family? Anybody. Play online? Anybody? Anybody that you can get to actually participate? Why do you play games? Do you get paid for it? It's fun. It's fun. Leave the order. It, 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 it relieves the boredom. It's something to do with other people. It's something that's social. It's something to do with other people. I like that. What else? Why do we play games? Anybody here getting paid to play games? I, again, I know I'm in Silicon Valley. What's up? It's competitive and challenging. It's competitive and challenging. That's exactly right. Thank you. So let me ask you this. How many of you are playing Sugar Crush or Farmville on Facebook? Nobody here. Wow. The Midwest is like everybody in the room. Is there one person? No. We're not like this. Oh, good. Okay. How many people Foursquare? How many people do Foursquare? How many people checked in when you got here tonight? Okay. How many people know what Foursquare is? All right. Everybody knows what Foursquare is. Why do people do Foursquare? What do you get from doing Foursquare? You get to be the king. You get to be the king. What else do you get? It's a history of where So you, you like the continuity, the history of where you've been? Yeah. Okay. I like because you guys have this phone. You get check in a store. You can give you There are discounts on Foursquare? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Did, you, did you all know this? That you can get discounts on Foursquare? How do you get a discount on Foursquare? How does that work? You check, for example, in Macy's, and they say, Thanks for coming in, and here's the discount code. That's exactly right. Absolutely. I know there's over here. They even have a deals nearby section. You don't even have to go to the place. You can kind of look around you. And, and then when you check in, you show us them, and they give you the discount. Wow. OK, so there's status, there's history, there's discounts, there's there's free food. <laughs> so I can shop at Macy's, <laughs> and then I can go get bigger waist pants, right, at Macy's, and then go eat at Chili's, right? I mean, I can. That's exactly right. So it's incentive, right, Alan? I have a friend who who, who does it purely. She is one of three people that are competing for points. Right. And, um, so she's actually in Kansas City. Uh, she put it on my phone so I could check her on the West Coast. <laughs> oh, that's not good. <laughs> it's on video. That's, that's funny, though. That's the reason why it happened at the time. But what, how many people have kids that check in on Foursquare? Anybody? Children of your own, children that you rent, nieces, nephews, those types of friends, children? Okay. Why do people play this stuff? Gives us a sense of connection, yeah. And in some cases, it gives us actual stuff. Like we can get coupon codes, and we can go out to eat. And what they do on Foursquare too, right, is that you know bring in free friends, and you get you know a meal for free or whatever. There's a lot of marketing that they're doing on Foursquare now, yeah. Also, you can know where I live. Right. You can know you can know where everybody is. And then, what do you like about that? Like, why do you care where anybody is? I'm three blocks away. I'm, I'm coming over. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, and then it goes back to being social, right? So games being social, Foursquare being social, checking in with each other. Just kind of a, how many people because of Facebook or because of LinkedIn or because of Twitter or Foursquare or some kind of technology that we have today have much more visibility into your friends and family's lives than you've ever had before? Okay. 
How many people, you see a friend or you talk to a family member that you haven't spoken with in, you know, a little bit, and they suddenly bring something up, and you're like, how did you, how did, you know, wow, geez, you look good in that dress at that whatever event. <laughs> you know, how many people have had that experience? Yeah, okay. All right, so intrinsic motivators, intrinsic motivators. We play games because we like them, but there's more to it, actually, than that. It's more to it than actually just that. We actually change the physiology, the physical constructs of our brains, and we get a chemical reward. So when we solve a challenge, when we level up, when we complete mastery, when we complete something in a game, how many people play cards? Anybody rummy, crazy apes, that kind of stuff? Okay, when we play. We play because it literally gives us a jolt. When we accomplish something, and sometimes for some of us, it gives us flow. Anybody know what flow is? What's flow? Anybody know the term flow? We would say zen, yeah? All I know is it was founded by a guy who I can't pronounce his name because it's about a lot of law. Yes. It's basically, flow is when you're in focus. How would I say? You're so in focus that you're so concentrated and, and you're, yeah, it is in line. Exactly. Thank you. You lose track of time. Track How many people garden or exercise or from some other way know about understand flow now, now that you've heard kind of a basic definition of it, okay? So for a lot of people playing games, being social like that, different types of games, it puts us into a state of flow. Challenges, solving problems, those types of things, the competition often gives us a jolt, a chemical jolt, right? So people get a little addicted to this stuff. We get a little addicted to this stuff. We get hooked on this stuff. And we're going to talk about it in a minute. I'll talk about it in a minute whether or not that's necessarily good or bad. So gangs. So gamification is this. There's no big mystery. Here's a basic definition of gamification. Gamification is applying game mechanics and game theory, in this case, to your instructional design, to learning. Gamification is applying game techniques, mechanics and techniques, and game theory to instruction, to promote learning. Yeah? What is game theory? We're going to talk about game theory. So we'll, we'll talk about, we'll talk, actually we'll talk about game theory just right now. So does that mean that we have to turn all of our instructional design into Angry Birds? Yes. <laughs> Some people would like that. No. And the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that when we're talking about gamification and the application of game theory and game mechanics, and gaming techniques to instruction, the research shows that your games don't even necessarily have to be entertaining. They don't even have to be entertaining. They just have to follow some basic gaming rules. And we'll talk about those gaming rules in a moment. So using age-old gaming techniques and innovative ways to transform learning and performance. Here are some of the uh, gaming techniques, right? So sense of accomplishment, self-paced, providing badges, right? People get something. There's a reward, right? Rewards. Being able to have a, a role, right? Being able to try something new on, like when we play games that have avatars, when the kids are playing the video games and they're playing a character on the screen. Gives us a chance to play with the role. Mastery, gives us a sense of mastery because we actually have accomplishments. Advancement, we can see actual progression. Right, when we're playing a game, you know what the game rules are, you know what the game rules are, and you can see progression when you, when you play with those rules. Competition, scaffolding, literally scaffolding, building, right, building as we go. They're social, they give us a sense of control. What's a leaderboard? Anybody know what a leaderboard is? What did we do when we played Miss Pac-Man or Pac-Man in the arcades? What happened when you had the highest score? You got what? 
You're on the leaderboard. You got to put your initials in at the end of the game, right? And how many people would go crazy dropping quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter into an arcade game to try and beat somebody else out on the leaderboard? Right? These resonate. <laughs> These resonate with people. Exactly. So it's the application of these things. How many people here in this room have some familiarity with something, at least one of these things that's on the screen in some other kind of context? <coughs> yeah? Okay. So why? Why do we as learning professionals want to do this now? So now we know what it is. Now let's talk about why. Because IQ scores, we keep talking about the kids are getting dumb because they're playing these video games. IQ scores have actually gone up since World War II. And in part because of the games that we play. And in part because of some of the video games. Now, mileage is going to vary. <laughs> mileage is going to vary. In the 1980s, remember me and my Duran Duran shirt, we used to have these commercials that talked about this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> All right, what was featured in those commercials? What did those commercials show? Fried eggs. Fried eggs. Because we thought what? Once you, once you did something to the brain cells, that was over. It was done. Static. Right? That the, you know, at a certain point in maturity, your brain would just have these many brain cells. Your brain would just be static, and it would just operate like that. And if you did something to hurt it, then there was no going back. And now in the past 10 or 15 years, with brain research, neuroscience, we now know about a concept called plasticity. What is plasticity? Ability, Ability to grow. And how do you mean, Varsha? Well, new neurons, new connections, and firings. Exactly. I mean, our brain literally, physiologically changes given the stimuli it's exposed to. So if you expose it to stimuli over and over and over again, it literally creates new neuron networks in your brain and new ruts that create new patterns of behavior. We're learning more today than ever before in neuroscience about how the black, what well, used to be a black box, because we have the technology now to do the scans, and we have a better understanding of the brain overall, and now it neuroscience's application to learning. So I have colleagues and stuff, and we argue over learning styles. We argue over what kinds of training techniques work. We argue over what learning is. We're getting more and more of a definition through science, through neuroscience, about those specific things. IQ scores have steadily gone up since World War II, and in part because of the games that we play. It has to do with, actually, we now have an understanding of what's called fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence, fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence is your ability to sit down, put a jigsaw puzzle together, solve a problem, a problem you've never seen before. So fluid intelligence means that you're able to strategically problem solve. You're able to puzzle something out. It's not something you learn. It's not something you have experience with. You're presented with something new and you have fluid intelligence. Crystal intelligence is learning and experience. Crystal intelligence is learning and experience. Crystal intelligence we have our entire lives. And we now know that we can build and build and build upon crystal intelligence. Fluid intelligence starts to dip in our 30s and 40s. For some of us, it really starts to dip in our 40s. <laughs> I can attest to that. Fluid intelligence. So what's happening is, because of the exposure to the stimuli, these games that the kids are playing, their brains are different than ours. I'm a Generation X. Who's the Generation X in the room? Anybody? Generation X? Who's a baby boomer? We're the millennials. Just a couple. Their brains are literally wired differently than ours. And I'm an older, I'm, at the, I'm right behind the baby boomer right behind the baby boomer generation. These kids today, their brains are literally wired differently because of the stimuli that they've been exposed to. And that study, as a matter of fact, that study, some of the neuroscience behind it, Berkeley is part of it. How many people have heard of a, a tool online called Lumosity? Yeah, Lumosity? 
it's based on this kind of, this is the research, this is where these resources come from. Part of the, part of the references that I'm using tonight is from Lumosity, from the Human Cognitive Project, Cognition Project. Stanford's a part of it, Berkeley, Harvard, number of universities, number of organizations around the world. What does Lumosity do? Anybody been on the website Lumosity? What happens on Lumosity? Um, they give you a bunch of different types of games that are supposed to help you develop certain skills, such as memory, attention, flexibility, and it's it's a game. It shows you your progress over time. Excellent. I play it. It's really fun. It's yeah. Fun. I enjoy it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And what is the significance of that? Why do we need to exercise our brains in the same way we need to exercise our muscles and our bones? We need to exercise our bones too. We think oftentimes in exercising that we're only exercising the muscles, but the bones are actually affected as well, as is the brain. Why do we need to exercise the brain? Why do we need tools like Lumosity? What does it prevent? Atrophy, Atrophy and Alzheimer's. We know a lot more about Alzheimer's now than we've ever known before, again, because the technology and the science is getting better. And we're understanding that again, in the 1980s, this is new stuff, right? The 1980s. We thought that the brain, once you did something to it, that it was over. And now we have a better understanding that the brain can actually repair its itself and change its configuration. It physically changes based on stimuli. Okay? And this makes a difference because we don't live in industrial age world anymore. That's the old world. The industrial age is over. Industrial age was about process, was about standard operating procedures and process. In organizations like the ones that we serve, you can hire a warm body, train them on the process, right? If X, then Y, and they could do that all day, every day, and produce results. That's why the valuation of organizations in the industrial age was based on how much property they own, how many widgets they produce, what inventory they had on hand, right? It was based on things. The industrial age was based on things. How are organizations being valued now? How do we understand what the value of an organization is today? I mean, literally, like the accounting and finance people. Profitability. Profitability based on new economy. What are the new drivers? In information, ideas. Yeah. R and D. And where are they? These innovation and ideas. In people's, In people's brains. Right? It's not about talent. And it's not just about what it is that we know and what it is that we can do. It's also about the networks that we can access as well. Our networks that we can access. Because we now know that information is easy to come by. We have the technology to connect for information, right? It used to be that we as learning professionals, as trainers, we were responsible for disseminating the information. We were the experts. We were the subject matter experts or represented the subject matter experts in the room. We don't have that position anymore. We're moving from training delivery. I want you all to sit here passively on your hands and I'm going to dump my expertise into your heads to more facilitation, where we're here in order to help people connect to each other as much as to connect to the facilitator, if not more, and to the resources that they need when it is that they need it. We don't need to walk around with all of it in our heads necessarily anymore, but it's people who can actually access the information that they need when they need it in order to get something done. This economy is based on human capital and talent. <coughs> And I know a lot of people go, Trish, we've heard for ages that organizations should care about their people. I'm not talking about caring about their people. I'm talking about literally we've got organizations like the Human Capital Lab out in Omaha, Nebraska as part of Bellevue University and other universities that are working on skills-based, <coughs> competency-based approaches instead of content-based approaches because it's not about content anymore. It's not about information. We don't have to spoon feed people. We have to teach them things so that they can access the resources when they need to, to be able to do something. It's not enough just to have the theory anymore, you have to have the practical application. Okay? Because it's a VUCA world. VUCA. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Are things going to go back to the way that they were? 
<laughs> Probably not. Maybe on a Sunday for about 10 seconds, but that's going to be about it. Okay, and they're saying that it's just, this is the new normal. Working under these circumstances, where things continue to be volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. How many people have seen their job change in the past 10 years? How about the past five years? How about yesterday? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, the three C's, the three C's as learning professionals, because here's the thing, guys, we need to get our act together, we need to get our act together as learning and performance professionals because we're responsible for everybody else's performance in the organization, or at least contributing to that, right? We're the people that need to be equipped and empowered to help other people be equipped and empowered to do the work that they need to do because of this. Because of this. Because of the three C's. Complexity, chaos, and change. Complexity, chaos, and change. Their roles continue to change in the organization. And one of the biggest things is, for the most part, many organizations don't work with top-down control anymore. Again, it's not process where you put a warm body in with the process and then things just go, if X then Y. It's too complex for that nowadays. And so we need nimble work teams, not many, you know, not assembly line. We need nimble work teams that can respond as things change because things are constantly changing. So we need to equip and empower them, which means that we're responsible for equipping and empowering ourselves. Why? Office campus. How many people just work with people in their building? Down the hall. You don't talk to anybody else outside of people just down the hall. Just in your building. Just in the state of California. Just people who work for your company. Okay. How many people work with just all sorts of different people, different functional areas of the organization. You work with competitors, you work with suppliers, you work with clients, you work with customers. How many people have some global, right, where you're working even outside of the United States? Okay? It's no longer tied to campus anymore. We're not tethered to the campus anymore. We're not tethered to these four walls. This represents Disambiguation. That's a really big word for Tuesday. <laughs> Disambiguation. Anybody know what that means? It means cutting out the middleman. Disambiguation means cutting out the middleman. And the reason why this is significant is, let me ask you this. Anybody buy a car recently? Anybody buy a car recently? Yeah? Did you go online, check prices beforehand? Okay. Yeah. What did you and what did you know before you walked into the dealership? Sticker. Sticker, inventory, pricing. <coughs> features, benefits. Features, benefits, features. sticker inventory. The, I mean the whole the whole nine yards. You have you have as much information as the people on the sales floor. Was it always like that? Fifteen years ago, was it like that? What was what was shopping for a car like fifteen years ago? Walking into a dealership. What did you have to do? Bring my dad. <laughs> He's 6'6". Six, six. I'm the little one in the family. Right? But why? Because we didn't have all the information. They had all the cards. And shopping for a car was an entirely different process. And you had to deal with the salesperson, right? You had to go in there and I had to put my big girl pants on and go in there and have to deal with the you know, sales guy that was going to try and get every last dime out of me and buy in the car. Now you have all the information where? Where do you get that information from? On your phone. Not even necessarily on your computer anymore, on your phone. Disambiguation. It's taking the middleman out. It's taking the middleman out. That counts for us too. Again, these people in this photo don't need us to help them put their hands on information. They have information. They can Google. The Google's been around for a while now. I hear it might have a little something, something to do with you. <laughs> but I live in Chicago, so. All right, disambiguation. They don't need us to be the sage on stage so much anymore. They need us to actually help them connect with the information and the resources that they need when they need them. Okay. 
And it's now a enterprise or web to a world. It's not about I anymore, it's about we. It's about we. It's not about the individual anymore, it's about what we can do together. The shift that we are going through is as big of a shift as from the agriculture age to the industrial age. It's as big as that shift as when people started coming out of the farms and into the cities to work on the manufacturing lines, on the assembly lines. It's as big of a shift as that, and we're right in the middle of it. And everybody's trying to kind of do the surfboard thing between old world as that's falling away and get our bearings on this new world. This is what's coming next. Do these kids want to sit through seven hour training programs? <laughs> no. Why? It's boring. Hmm? It's boring. Hey, yeah, yeah. You don't need that much time. That's not like What's that? You don't need that much time to deliver information. And that's exactly what it is. So we came up in a world where it made sense, thank you, where it made sense in the industrial age that we were the keepers of the information and the expertise. That was our job in training and development and learning and performance. Our job was to dispense the information and show people how to work, process, and procedure. We still have some of that today. But the expectation anymore isn't that we're necessarily the expert in the room dispensing that knowledge. These kids, again, they can get to their own information. They don't need us to be the middleman. Gamification. Foursquare, coupons, shopping. By 2015, 50% of all innovation and 70% of the global 2000, their apps are going to be gamified. Gamification is sweeping through marketing. It's sweeping through these other disciplines. This is what the world is moving towards. We need to follow accordingly. Okay. Why? Pyramid of change, right? We usually pay attention. Training has been in this world here, changing behaviors, right? And very content driven. Give them content, give them content, give them content. Make them sit in a chair until we give them content. Stay in your chair, we're going to give you more content. Stay in your chair, we're going to give you more content. Please don't write anything down. I gave it all to you in your handout. I'm just here to give you content. And it works. It doesn't work anymore. Because we're not trying to just change behavior anymore, again, because the processes change by lunch. <laughs> they do. We need to pay more attention deeper onto the waterline. We need to change people's mental models. We need to change the structures that they work in. Training doesn't do that. Training is only effective Training is only an appropriate intervention to close gaps in skill and our knowledge. We need other tools in our toolkit. So U.S. organizations in 2011 <coughs> spent over $156 billion, and what did they get for their money? What did they get for their money? Us. What did we do? The same as we did the game before. Yeah, well, and what value did we bring to an organization? What did we do? How do we help the organization achieve its mission and vision? By enabling their employees to do what they needed to do. If we're lucky. And what does that mean? We're doing what? Employee engagement. Employee engagement. Why, why, isn't, thank you, why is employee engagement such a big deal right now? Who cares? Let them go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's Chicago. Billions of dollars per year in the U.S. alone is lost due to unengaged employees who are not productive. And then that doesn't include the low morale, the poison spreading, and everything else. Why do we care? Let them be, let them be low morale. Let them sit and stew at their desks. Why does that, why does that matter? 
Profit? <laughs> profit? Why does that matter in profit? Because they're knowledge workers and all they're contributing is their knowledge and their engagement and their involvement. If they're not contributing, if they're just uh, the presenteers are just being there and, and not working or not giving their all, then we're paying them for nothing. And that costs our bottom line. That's exactly right. So that's exactly right. Thank you for that, Alan. We are in charge of improving other human beings' performance within an organization. And I'm here to tell you, if we're not doing that, then we're not doing our jobs. We're not doing our jobs. If we had a manufacturing line that wasn't achieving its, if you, let me change that. If you went to Sears and you bought a washing machine and it didn't do its job, what would you do with it? You'd return it. Do you have some words with the people at Sears? <laughs> right, you have some words. We are producing training defects. And I'm here to tell you, this whole idea in the United States, how many people are into learning technologies and e-learning and got moved into that direction simply because the organization said, no more instructor-led classroom, we want everything, we're trying to lower costs on how we deliver training. How many people have been driving that boat? Sometimes? Easy. Okay. Here's the thing. In corporate America, they're literally looking at training as a cost center. Learning as a cost center, right? They don't look at us as an investment. They look at us as a cost center. And what's happening in the United States is that they're replacing poor performance with training and the learning professionals with bad technology. But if you're still going to get the same bad results, you might as well do it at a fraction of the cost and not pay the labor overhead. <laughs> this is true. We are producing defects. $156 billion a year. I'm in a room full of my peers. What do we do? What value do we bring to the organization? Okay. Our job is to improve the performance of others, to equip and empower them so that they can execute against the strategic objectives of the organization to carry out the mission and vision of that organization. That's our job. These metrics, they don't work anymore. These are industrial age metrics. It's not enough. It's not enough to just be reporting on these things. I have a friend of mine who actually reports how many pounds of flesh are trained in a fiscal year. <laughs> and the executives asked her, they said, why are, you, why are you reporting pounds of flesh? And she said, well, it's about as useful as knowing how many people sat in a chair and received training. <laughs> right? Counting. Counting is a hallmark of the industrial age. Counting is over. These are no longer the right performance metrics. I am in one of the technology hotbeds from around the world. I often equate what's happening as an emerging profession in learning and performance to what's happening with technology and IT. How many people technology and IT? You work for in technology or IT or a company that's technology or information technology, right? Performance metrics changed over there. IT department's going crazy. For 20 years, IT was responsible for locking everything down. Now they got people walking in after the holidays with 17 different devices and they want access on the guest Wi-Fi. I want my iPhone to work. I want my tablet to work. I want my Galaxy to work, right? You're logging me off of Facebook on my desktop. That's great. Got my smartphone. I'm on your guest Wi-Fi. Changing, performance metrics, counting things is no longer enough. So you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. We need to shift and transform. All right, Trish, call to action. What do we do? Every learning professional's ultimate aim is to improve human performance to drive organizational outcomes. If you don't know how you align to organizational outcomes, you are not doing the job. You're not doing the job.
mission statement for ASD. We are creating a world that works better. I love that play on words. We are creating a world that works better through learning and performance. And learning and performance, the very name means that we're talking about a suite of competencies, not any one thing, right? Training for too long has been the only tool in the toolkit. We still need training to close gaps and skill and knowledge, but it's not enough. The industrial age is over. We need other things. We need other interventions. We need change management. We need coaching. We need mentoring programs. We need stretch assignments, job rotation. We need learning programs. It's time for us to grow up. We're about 15 years behind IT. Think about it. 20 years ago, did we have chief technology officers or CIOs? No. We didn't need them. That economy didn't exist yet. It was just coming into being. Now we've got the rise of the chief learning officer, the CLO. So we're either going to get on the stick as a profession and get this together, or they're going to replace us with really bad technology. That's what's going to happen. So models. You've got the ASCD competency model. This is the new one that just got released in March of this year. And you've got a fabulous organization, right, with the ASCD Golden Gate gig here that's helping you understand and bringing you programs that specializes in these different areas of expertise. So professional skills, right, the actual technical competencies are defined around the outside of the model. And then the foundational competencies are defined down here at the bottom. So take a look at your handouts, if you would, please. See where it says business skills at the top? Here's where it is in the model. What business skills, Trish? What does business skills mean? Well, here's a listing. And these aren't all the business skills that are referenced in the competency model. These are just business skills for purposes of tonight. Instructional design. It's one of the professional areas of expertise, yeah? OK. Specifically, what skills in instructional design? Technology literacy, learning technologies, interpersonal skills, and global mindset. These are no good without these. Well, these, without the foundational competencies, you're limited in scope. If you're an instructional designer and can't talk to leadership or can't have a conversation with subject matter experts and facilitate a meeting, you are limited in your marketability. If you're a facilitator, if you're a training person and you deliver training all day and don't know how to facilitate, you are limited in your marketability. Don't chase things that are dying. It's not a good time to be a newspaper editor. It's not. It's not a good time. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be an expert in all of these. You need a base level of competency. And basically, you can be an expert in one or two of these things, right? That's usually what we do. We're an expert in one or two, and we like to go deep in one or two. But how do you draw from these other integrated disciplines in order to enhance who you are and what you do and the value that you bring to the organizations that you serve? That's the point of the competency model. Again, get certified or don't, but at least have an understanding of this. How many people here again are members of ASCD National, the national organization? Okay. You guys have access to, through your membership, if you would write this down, a tool called the Career Navigator. Career Navigator. If you go to ASD.org and if you just search on ASD.org for Career Navigator, it'll give you a free online tool. You can pick your role and your level, your seniority in your role, in your organization, and it will actually walk you through question by question and assess you against the KSAs in that competency model. And what you get at the end is a report that shows you where your strengths are and where are some areas for improvement. When I work with the people that I work with, with learning professionals such as yourself, I have them do it twice. One, so that you get an idea of current state. Who are you and where are you in the organization today? And then second, who do you aspire to be? So if you're staff now and want to be a manager, run it a second time. But this time, pick a role that would be your stretch assignment, right? Or if you're a manager now and you want to become a director or a vice president, you want to be an executive, 
you can actually you can run the report multiple times, just pick a different role and level. If you're a training, you deliver a training and you want to learn the instructional design side, you can do that too. And then you'll have a roadmap for your own professional development plan where you'll know the specific skills and knowledge that you need as part of your ASCE membership, right, to work on in order to start moving in that direction. So roadmap. Okay. So again, these are the competencies for tonight. These are the skills for tonight. They're in the PowerPoint deck, but they're right there on that first page. So application of these back to gamification. Application of these competencies, these skills and knowledge back to gamification. We play games and learning all the time. How do we take age old gaming techniques and apply it to our design of learning? To deliver a learning program that engages people and meets them where they're at. Because as more and more of these millennials in particular come into the workforce, they're not, they're not gonna, they're not gonna tolerate old world. They're already not tolerating old world. Geez, those of us from the old world don't tolerate old world <laughs> so much, right? So masters, and I wanna, um, so anybody here certified professional learning and performance and ACPLP, stand up, Alan, be recognized. <laughs> Trish helped me get through that. <laughs> CPLP, again, you don't have to get certified, but there's a growing community. There's about 1,600 CPLPs worldwide. You can find them on LinkedIn. Just type in CPLP as a keyword. These are people that have been obsessed against the model, and I'll tell you what, they're early adopters. They're good at their game. They're good at their game. Most of them are accessible and friendly. How many people know this person? Well, not this person on here. How many people know who she is? Lou Russell? Queen of Project Management, Queen of Emotional Intelligence, does a lot around uh, IT and leadership. Lou wrote the Accelerated Learning Field Book back in the 1990s, and we're still not using it. <laughs> we're still not using it. Accelerated Learning Techniques back in the 1990s. If you take one of Lou's workshops, you learn through experience and through games. You do stuff. Because it's about performance, not just sitting there and collecting content and information in your head. Games. How many people know this guy? Anybody know Richard? Alan Interactions? Michael Allen? Anybody here? Authorware? Anybody old school? Macromedia Authorware? Anybody? Design learning technologies? Wow. This is one of the best-selling books on ASCD Press of all time. Leaving Addy for Sam. Why? Because Addy ain't working anymore. Addy's dead. Addy's a project manager. Addy's been dead. We've just hacked Addy, but we still call it Addy, because that's the word that we learned along the way. If you are doing something that you think is Addy, and you're not doing discrete phases that have a beginning and an end, well, you're lucky. <laughs> if you do analysis and get to go into design and never go back to analysis again, if you get into design and get to go into development and never go back to design again, because that's what Addy is, discrete phases. And if you hacked it and said, well, okay, wait a minute, we need to do analysis again because, well, I don't know, there's some other crazy stakeholder group that seemed to just show up out of nowhere. <laughs> Or somebody finally came to a meeting and said, we don't like that about the design, we need to change this piece about the development. That's not Addy. Addy is dead. It's been dead. We just didn't call it. Addy is an industrial age model that came out of manufacturing. It's the same thing with SDLC for software development. We used to be able to just do analysis. Now we would do design. And we would do development. We would close those phases before we progress to the next. That doesn't mean that SAM is the end all be all. SAM is based on Agile. Success approximation method. S-A-M. Success approximation method. How many people know Agile or are familiar with Agile in another term? Agile project management, right? Here's the basic idea behind Agile. In a waterfall or SDLC world, I'll just say this, in the old world, in the Addy world, right? Because all of these models are interlinked. We have drawn from other disciplines for our entire 
for our entire existence in learning and performance. We inherit from construction, we inherit from the Air Force, we inherit from manufacturing, right? We inherit from these other fields that are a little bit uh, out in front of us. <coughs> that was all about, again, closing discrete phases. You, didn't, you ended one before you started, before you started the, the next one. And the whole focus was on closing those phases, completing the tasks that were in those phases to get the job done by a particular date within a certain budget. Agile and concepts like Agile are about delivering value to the organization. You keep doing it until you've delivered something of value. If you haven't delivered value back to the business, that project ain't over. That's Agile in a very small nutshell. It's a focus, it's a shift in focus. So Allen Interactions has another framework now. So they teach SAM, which is based on an Agile methodology, but they've taught this, CCAF, for a really long time. So this is a great little tool, and this is something that you can apply right away as an instructional design framework to gamification. In your learning, pre present some context, and then right up front, give people a challenge. Challenge them. How many people have ever seen Bob Pike talk about hostages and vacationers in the training rooms? <laughs> okay? So how many people know of Bob Pike? So Bob, Bob started the Bob Pike group back in the 1970s. The man, he's still kicking it strong today. He does amazing things in this new economy. And he talks about this. You design for three different audiences. One, the people that are there eager to learn. And the other two, the vacationers and the hostages. <laughs> the vacationers are glad to be anywhere but at their desks, and the hostages are there by force. How many people have ever had a training session blow up or witnessed a training session blow up because there was a hostage that took over, hostile takeover of the training room? Anybody ever seen this? <laughs> right? So the way that you catch people's attention is you start with a little bit of context up front, then give everybody a challenge, right? Level set their expectations right off the bat, provide them with an activity, and then provide them feedback, and then do it again. Just a quick little, quick little design, instructional design model, a way to structure learning. Do you use SAM all the time? No. Do you use CCAF all of the time? No, but they're places to start. Yeah? I don't want to take you too far, but can you describe the difference between challenge and activity, like what, what's an example of each? You're literally, oh, it, it, really good question. You're literally challenging their mental models in the room. So this might be the game where you're introducing competition, or this might be something where you're really getting people to really focus, whereas an activity might be something like, we could do some kind of a challenge, like we could do um, teams at the tables and then pit the tables against each other, or we can give them an exam, right? So something that goes, okay, you guys think you know how, you know, X, Y, and Z, great, here's a pop quiz, and give them an exam. You're literally making that adrenaline really kick. And then the activity is a follow-up activity. So they're gonna take whatever you debriefed out of the challenge and then pour that into an activity that's gonna reinforce what came out of here. So this is the jolt. Yeah? Helpful, thank you. So we can use this and putting this into games. We can do the setup, we can give them a game or a challenge, right? We can make the challenge a game. We can give them an activity to do afterwards and then provide them with some feedback. Um, Richard and I have been blogging about what got us here won't get us there and the changes from the industrial age. We're still using old tools and models. All right. Where's this from? <laughs> <laughs> Shall we play a game? Saw. No, it's. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. It's the computer from War Games. It is. Computer from War Games. And what happened with the computer from War Games? It went nuts. What was it doing? Trying to blow up the thermal. Thermal nuclear? <laughs> right? And it went, it went crazy, it just went spastic and out of control. Just kept playing the same pattern, kept playing the same pattern, kept playing the same pattern, kept playing the same pattern. We need to break the pattern. Okay, let's play a game. Okay, how many people have a device? How many people have a device that gets internet access? 
Does everybody, at least one person at the table, have internet access? Okay, fabulous. Um, I'm going to give you a second here to get on the internet access. Sandy, can you remind us which SSID should we use? The one that's not employed. The one that's not employed. And then once you hit that, once you connect to that, to that network, you're going to need to bring the browser up and click on agreeing to the agreement. Agree to the agreement. We're going to work at tables. We're going to work at tables in order to design a game and then play the game. Design a game and then play the game. Okay. So our goal with this is to use technology and community to crowdsource solutions to problems. What is crowdsourcing? Anybody know? Crowdsourcing? I'm not sure, but I'll post a question on LinkedIn and ask if anyone can tell me. <laughs> 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 right now and see if I can get an answer. All right. Do you want to explain what you just explained? I hate Veronica. I thought it was collaborative funding, but I guess it could be collaborative problem solving as well. Absolutely. So thank you. So traditionally what we used to do is that if we had a problem, we would go to the experts, right? You get a panel of experts together. And actually, has anybody ever heard of the book, The Wisdom of Crowds? So there's a book called The Wisdom of Crowds where they've done a lot of research now that says, you know what, if you do a cross section, right, not just the experts, if you go to the experts, you're going to get expected solutions. But if you crowdsource it, if you open it up so that you really have this mix, right, of experts and non-experts and some people that, and I mean, we're talking like big stuff, like they're looking for a submarine, our US Navy is looking for a submarine that went down somewhere and they basically talked to 200 people. They take a cross section of 200 people that includes some experts and some moms that they found at the grocery store. And you come up with a better solution by doing that because they found moms at the grocery store. Moms know what happened, <laughs> right? Quora. What's that? Quora. Quora? Quora? Q-U-O-R-A? Yeah. It's a crowdsourcing. It's a crowdsourcing. Yeah. Excellent. 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 Okay. But it's basically putting solutions together. So we've got a cross-section of people in this room that have different levels of experience. Right? So we're going to crowdsource some problems for today. And I'm going to award prizes based on good performance. All right? We're going to have a leaderboard. We're going to have some points. A leaderboard, all right. A leaderboard? <laughs> I'm going to show you. Anybody here? Evernote? These guys? Heard of them? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've driven past their office every once in a while. and been waving to them while I've been on the highway. What is Evernote? It's pretty awesome. PowerPoint. Pretty awesome. What is Evernote? It's like a brain for your it's like brain. A binder. It's a brain for your brain. It's like a binder. It's like a binder online. And what's cool about it, it's free. Free? Yeah. It's online. It lives in the cloud. What's that? You can access it without being on the internet. Yes, you don't have to be connected. So, and that's what's great. So you have stuff, and you can, um, it's device agnostic. So if I have stuff, I can get to it when I'm at the grocery store, I can get to my notes while I'm on my iPhone. If I'm at home or at the, I'm if, if I'm at home, I have Evernote installed on my desktop, I can get to my stuff in my Evernote notebooks through multiple devices, which is great because I have different devices that I have access to depending on where I'm at and what environment I'm particularly in. So Evernote is free. Um, and Evernote collects, you can put all kinds of stuff in your trunk, in your notebook, right? You can put all sorts of stuff in there. You can put in text, you can put in images, you can create audio files, you can put in uh, video. And uh, if you want to expand, you know, it's like any of the other um, services like this, there's the free and the fee based. So you get, you know, a certain amount of access uh, and then if you want more space to put in more stuff, you can, I think it's like $45 a year to go premium. It's like crazy good. I know parents that are using this now as a portfolio for their kids' college applications. 
So if your child is well-rounded, like let's say you've got a child that's you know applying to school, you can put in a clip of you know your son playing saxophone, the poetry that he wrote or the essay that he wrote, you know whatever media that actually represents that young adult that would be of interest to a college that or university that that young adult is applying for. Because what you can do is not only you have access to the notebooks that you create within your Evernote account, but on an individual notebook by notebook, think of notebooks almost like a folder, but on a notebook by notebook basis, you can make them private or public. By default, they're all private. But if you want to make it public, like the one I have set up for you tonight, you can do that. the old fashion way. Okay, so this is an Evernote folder. I'll give you the URL that you can tap into. And our goal is going to be to crowdsource some problems. You're going to work together at your tables as a team. You're going to crowdsource some problems, right? And then contribute media to this public folder. So this public folder, so right now there's only a couple of things in the public folder. These are the items that are in the public folder. And the way that media gets into my folder, well anybody can go and take a look at it, and I'll give you the web address in just a moment. You can go in the folder and actually look at the contents. But the way to get media easily into the folder is to email it, is to email it into the folder, okay? And I'm going to give you an email address so that the media that you create at your tables, you can email into the actual folder. And what we'll get then is, you know, look at all this beautiful collaboration from all of the different folks that we have in the room. Give you a couple of problems to solve, right? Have a conversation, put some media together, contribute it. Now, there's points based on the type of media that you use in order to get this done. Many of us have devices where we basically use the basic functions and haven't had an opportunity to really explore some of the functions that we have, like our smartphones. I know a lot of people using their iPhones or their Galaxies have never shot video before. <coughs> Usually people make phone calls and take photos, right? Maybe a text message or two. So this is your opportunity tonight to explore playing around perhaps with some media the more robust the media you contribute to the folder, the more points your team gets. Okay? Ready? All right. And then when we're done, everybody's going to have access because even after tonight, I'm going to leave this public folder. So here's the web address for the public folder. It's a bit.ly, which just means the bit.ly is being used in order to shorten, to abbreviate the web address because web address is this big and the bit.ly is this big. So bit.ly forward slash capitalization matters. So ASTD GG2013, 2013. So even after tonight, you can go in the folder after tonight and take a look at all the cool stuff that people contributed. So you can set this up. You can use this in your classrooms. You can do this tomorrow, right? Okay, so going back to your handouts. Going back to your handouts. On the front there, we've got the actual competencies and the actual skills, right, that apply to tonight. What I'd like you to do is to, as a group, as a team at your tables, is to pick two. Pick two. And if somebody was working on those skills to get better at them, best practices, your own experiences or your thoughts on this, Picking two, what are some things, you can interview each other, right? What are some things that people could do in order to practice and get better at those particular skills? Pick two. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, 
six different uh, areas of expertise or competencies identified, and then beneath them, the actual bullet points are the actual skills. So across all of them, pick two skills, and then you're going to create media. Now, here's the other cool thing. So there's video you can do, there's audio you can do, you can write things down. We've even got, we've got some flip chart paper, we've got some markers in the back, right? You can do that. How would you get flip chart paper into that a picture, right? A picture. Okay. I am. Anybody? Any questions? Good question. I will give you. Yes, I will give you the instructions and the email address. Okay. So, um, as a team, discuss it. Right. So these skills and the competencies. The more visual, again, the more robust the media, the more points you're going to get. Be creative. And then you're going to email the media, right? I'll give you the email address, and it's right here. So this is the crazy email address. Somebody's going to have to get up from their chair in order to access this, right? Mm -hmm. That's the email address. So you're going to have the discussion, create the media, then attach that media to the email and actually send it in and submit it to the folder. And we'll collect everything in that particular folder. And we're picking two skills or two of the bullet points? Two, two, the skills are the bullet points. So pick two of the bullet points. Yeah, two of the bullet points under any of those competencies. And then what you do when you email into Evernote is in the subject line, if you put a, at ASTDGG, it goes into the right notebook in my Evernote account. You also need to come up with a team name Come up with a team name, and you're going to put a hashtag, the pound sign, the number sign, also in the subject line, and that's how we're going to know, I'm going to know which team it came from, okay? Yes? We're the A team back here, okay? You're the A team, okay. <laughs> well, I'll come around and find out what your team names are, too, as well. I'm going to give you 15 minutes. You ready? I'm going to give you 15 minutes. You ready? Go. Uh, so, let's just take a couple minutes. Well, how would you, how would you advise 
to make a video so that would give the visual, the voice, Describing the text on the board by the writer. I don't know, or unless it's separate. I think you should just try and focus on other ideas. So, for example, you have to be able to know what the fail is. Old school would be finders hand in hand. Trying to think of what are the technology for the technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, what we're practicing is going for the 50 points because that makes it the game. See, that's what we're here for. Technology with this gizmo, cha cha cha. Okay. I think if, if you start getting going, we will have some of these. So, if you
um, to me is, um, I mean, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, you have the email, right? Yes. All the ledge. all the ledge. This is skills for the ledge. This is skills for the ledge. S. L. E. L. E. Sure. Or just this skills. Yeah. Let's get on the same side. Owls. M.Evernote.com And then this goes after at Evernote.com Oh, okay. And then our team. Okay. And subject at quick. At subject at ASTD. G. Is it G dot G dot? It's no, sorry. G G. G G. It's ASTD. G G. All capitals. And then pound in our team name, correct? Yeah. Which is. Is there a space between the class line? Or is that the same? I think so. Well, it's a subject line. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. O W O S D G dot C A three six S N D dot com. Now we have to do a second thing. You may be able to write and click on this. Or you may be able to send it. Is there an option to send? So if you send the image, then you put your email. Two minutes. What is it? Is that a fight? No, it's just a one. Okay, I got goal setting. I got infographic. Okay, I got an infographic goal setting. I don't have no idea what to do with it. Outrageously sim simple visual guide to goal setting. Of course, this is a. They're selling it. Yeah. Do you have the email? So what's the Okay. Okay. Oh,
It was really good. Okay, let's see. So, right? Right click it. Which is not like right here. Oh. See it. Oh, yeah, you can. I don't know how you have your keyboard set up. Do you do a two? Save it. I don't know how I ever know what works. I think you want to send it as an attachment, but I don't know. Ever know a until an image is smart. Okay. Just send it from my personal email.
in a moment here to find out who won. I'm seeing some cool stuff. So, so tell me about this activity. Tell me about what did you learn that was unexpected? Anybody learn any, something unexpected? Not from the presentation, but from doing this activity. Anybody learn something new about their device? Yes. Yes? What did yes. you learn about? What, what, what was something new that somebody learned about their device? Tricia? Oh. There's no what? URLs and apps. You have to go to the website. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's tricky. How many people used a feature on their device that they hadn't used before? Anybody shoot video with your sound for the first time? Anybody? No. Wow. You guys are really good. Wow. Yeah. So we got it. I forget. I forget where I stand. All right, awesome. So what was the first thing that you did when you first sat down as a team in order to solve this challenge? What was the first thing you did? We tried to figure out the rules. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> we tried to figure out what you wanted. Yeah. yeah. We tried to rehash what the rules were, and everybody had heard it all the different. Oh, OK. So you had a level set on what the expectation was. All right, fabulous. And how did that go? It went good when I came up and asked you again. <laughs> <laughs> good. When you came up and asked for clarification. Okay, good. Fabulous. Excellent. So you had a level set on the rules and then asked for some more input in order to get that. Great. What else? What was... We went through picking the two bullet points and then we divided and conquered. So two did one and two did the other and then we shared the ideas. Okay. Very good. So, um, some collaboration there and I'm sure some negotiation, right? Because some people at some tables, they have a different idea of what two to focus on, right? Now, when you started reading the skills, was there any conversation about what one of the skills meant? Yeah. Yeah? Briefly. Briefly? So what did that kind of look like? Do we think this counts in terms of getting points? <laughs> okay, do we think this counts in terms of getting points? Excellent, and so take that a little bit further, like, so was there strategy, like, let's talk about this skill or these skills rather than these, because we think it's going to be more points? The strategy was some of us had already curated uh, repositories of information, so it was, while that person was gathering their repository, one person was sending it to Evan. It was more of a one person does one does this, and so we work, we work together. Cool. Okay, so you work together as a team, but everybody had individual tasks that they were doing, so that you could do things in parallel and get more points. Nice. Anybody have a different table with a different strategy? We were just trying to survive, Trish. We were just trying to figure out what you were doing. I was trying to turn my phone on. I don't know. I, don't know. I usually come to these things and turn my phone off. I was trying to do it. We attempted to do it as a whole team, and then we tried to do a video, but the technology kind of became what we were just The technology, that never happens. Great <laughs> technology always works. Wow, OK. So then um, what did you do when the technology failed? Or didn't work as expected? We took a photograph and then um, wrote a description. Perfect. Excellent. OK. 
So found a found a workaround, right? And we're able to, to do it from there. Excellent. What else? Different strategy? How did you figure out what skills? Excellent. And then how did you divvy up the work? How did you, did you, did you divide up the work? Or did you, everybody kind of talk at the table at the same time? <laughs> talk to the table, at, <laughs> talk to the table at the same time? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah? We divided it. You divided it. So different approaches, different strategies, different ways of being able to deal with a particular activity. So a lot of a lot of flexibility, right? And a lot of creativity. A lot of creativity. How many people are interested in seeing what media is actually in the folder now? Like you're curious to see what else is out there, right? Okay. What's that? We want to see what they did, but we want to show what we did. But you also want to show what you did. Okay, and, and why is that? Like what? I want the prize. Because it's awesome. Because <laughs> it's awesome, right? It's awesome. I want the prize. Exactly. Collaboration, it's curious. Excellent. So, yeah. So an idea I just, that came up is, so if in fact there's a role play regarding the some sort of a communication, coaching uh, or training a group of managers to be doing performance evaluation, for example, okay, that then they could do a role play and they could video it right then and there and then share them so they, and the walk away would be 20 examples, not just one. Right. Exactly. And then think about the, was there, thank you, that's an excellent tie back to this, yeah. Um, so that's actually what we do um, in my company and then we actually use the videos in a weekly newsletter. So I work in cosmetics, so then they sort of make these videos like commercials or what have you. And then when the launch comes, the launch time frame, then we release the videos over the launch time frame so that then they're teaching each other. And that's fabulous, yeah. Trisha. We use videos for our new hire training because their salespeople are all from California to New York, you know, north to south, including Canada now. So we have them videotape themselves demoing our product, our devices, and um, talk with their, their local mentor so they can get practice. Because you're your own worst critic, really. That's what the power of it is. Fabulous. No, that's, that's great. And, and why, so why is the, and thank you all for the contribution. And why do people want to see other people's videos? Like, why would you include them in a newsletter? Well, I think actually, to be honest, a lot of it is that they want to see themselves. So, yes! Um, we, we work with a lot of millennials, and they're <laughs> constantly taking selfies, and we do things like <laughs> selfie, selfie contests, <laughs> and like, we have a kind of called Safe Wallace, so we actually own the hashtag stay flawless, you know, like that type of thing so then they can see each other and, you know, they, they want to see themselves but then they want to compare to each other and it, it keeps things challenging and fresh instead of being standing in front of the that's a great example. And do they compete like my video got in, your video, yeah, they, your video? Yeah, they absolutely do. And um, they'll send me um, an email and be like, Jill, why don't you pick this? Right. <laughs> and I've got, you know, 45 meetings or whatever. And I'm like, well. Excellent. Like, you know, maybe sure. be an Excellent. So instead of creating a policy that says you have to create this media or you have to learn these things, you disguise it as a game. You incent them by making it competitive. There are rewards and recognition that are built in because they get to see themselves and they know that that media that they created gets disseminated out to... And they get a prize and they're very competitive between, because we work with Sephora and Ulta and Macy's and Bell and them, that they're very competitive within the channels too. So okay. they're like, oh, you know, you did Ulta again this week. And I'm like, oh, that's the best video. So. <laughs> right. Exactly. And this is great. Are you are you guys starting to see how this can be incorporated? How you can use this, Alan? So just another, uh, I, something I did a few years back is when I was at a company, I knew there was a whole bunch of knowledge that people had, but nobody knew where it was or what it was. Um, we uh, and I was 
challenge of come, coming up with like a new a whole training program, a new high stuff. I, I created the, the great learning content treasure hunt. Yep. I said, you know, you send me stuff and I'll give points to it. The person who gets the best point, yeah, people, top three uh, people will get, will get a, you know, Starbucks cards that we were throwing out. Uh, I got like 40 people from a, from a company of 80, 90 people. I got 40 pieces of information, of which about half of them I already had seen, but about half of them I had. Right. Fabulous. And I know people that do like intranets and, um, you know, like SharePoint kind of stuff. They're rolling out a new technology. So instead of giving people like, you know, 500 page binder of go and take a look at this, give them a, give them a challenge, give them a competition, make it a game for them to, you know, a work group or a team or a particular department that submits, you know, do a scavenger hunt, right? The ones that figure it out. And you can incent it so that not only do they learn, but maybe they have to shoot a video or take a photo of them teaching somebody else. How powerful is that, right? So it's, it's just using game techniques based on game theory. So game theory is just basically around, we know that collaboration works. We know that people are social. We know that people want to belong together. We know that they want to compete against each other. We know the power of rewards and recognition and gamification. So we get the techniques we get the game mechanics and the techniques based off of the different gaming theories. And there are different gaming strategies that we can use in order to bring together a desired result. And that's basically the rule. So games don't even have to be entertaining, even though we think about games often as being entertaining. It doesn't have to be angry birds, right? It doesn't have to be all cutesy and this and another thing. But what it has to do is it has to be specific. It has to have a specific objective and within the context of learning, you still want good instructional design where there's still a debrief and feedback that happens afterwards, right? So give them something to do. You can gamify it so that they challenge themselves and each other. You can play them off of each other. You can play them off of themselves. Give them a chance to have some mastery around it, to win some things, to level up, right? To advance, to get ahead. Completion is a very powerful thing. There are so many things in our lives that feel I didn't check anything off my to-do list today because my to-do list changed 17 times. Games can also be helpful with that too because we see progress and we see accomplishments. Excellent. Anything else as we close out tonight? Anything else to contribute for tonight? I have a parting gift for everybody for playing and I will tally up the points. So if you're a team and you think that you had enough points to win and you would have needed video tonight, I think, you would have had to have shot a video tonight in order to win the prize prize, um, if you're one of the teams and you think you had enough to win, come, come see me afterwards. I'm going to take a look at the points real quick. Um, but I have a parting gift for everybody. And I'm going to put this in the folder because I want to encourage everybody to go out to the folder. And the parting gift for everybody is going to be this PDF file. It's actually the new version of Bloom's Taxonomy with Create at the top. Bloom's taxonomy, so we go from knowledge to comprehension, remembering something to understanding something. So from simple recall up to the higher cognitive functions, creating, to be able to create something is much different than being able to recite to memorize something. So this is the revised Bloom's taxonomy, and it not only tells you the keywords, so when you're writing your learning objectives, you say, okay, I'm designing, and I want somebody to be able to, you know, evaluate what are keywords that I want to be able to use in order to do that. It also tells you the different technologies that are around today that you could use in order to support that. Nice. That's Yay. a cool tool. <laughs> That's a cool tool. So I'll put that in the Evernote nice. folder. I'll put that in the Evernote folder for you too. And I'll, I'll leave the Evernote folder will be open for at least the next, let's say, so today's the 6th. I'll keep the Evernote folder open until the 13th. Is that good? Is that a good commitment? Yeah. And I'll put a PDF of the slide deck in there, too. Oh, Ooh. thank you. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Did you have fun? Yes. yes. Thank you. Did you learn something? Yes. yes. Excellent. OK, we've got a couple of announcements as we're wrapping up. All right. So it's coming up very quickly, and it's very um, amazing that we have another caliber of speaker coming next week. Do you want to talk a little bit about Tom Coleman? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone here ever heard of Articulate? <laughs> yeah? Anyone here got re is, is a 
uh, against the rapid e-learning blog. Uh, there's a guy called Tom Coleman who's the community manager for Articulate Software. People have come up with Articulate Studio and uh, last year Articulate Storyline. That, together with Captivate, maybe Zebra Zaps, are kind of the hottest tools at the moment for creating e-learning and maybe creating gamified e-learning. You can get to see Tom Coleman live, in person, in the flesh, teach you, teach you how to become what they call a rapid e-learning pro. He has a one-day workshop that he's doing for us for virtually nothing. Uh, like next Tuesday, he's going to be in doing that workshop up in San Francisco at SFSU. Very close to the bar, within a very short walk of Caltrain. And if you can't make that one, on the Thursday, he's doing a one-day introduction to Storyline. Again, ridiculously cheap, a couple of hundred bucks compared to if you go, go to the, uh, I think I saw it for about 450 I actually got an ad, an ad from uh, an articulate um, uh, registered, an articulate authorized uh, vendor. It was like 450 bucks for one day class. We've got Tom Coleman, the guy from Articulate, he's coming to do it for about 250 And if you're busy during the day and it's, it's real hard but you still want to meet him, come along on Wednesday evening because we've got a workshop where he's doing a short version of you know, the power of rapid e-learning. And both that power of rapid e-learning and his full day of work on rapid e-learning, those are going to be tool neutral. Okay, uh, now I, I was really, really excited to be, to be having, getting to see Tom because last year, so in 2000, uh, 2012, uh, I was uh, involved with uh, Trish's chapter back in Chicago and we had Tom Coleman come in November. Of course, I moved here in June and I missed it. So I was very, very pleased to be able to get Tom to come this year. So that's the two events or three, three of those events are showing up for the set for ASTD Gongge uh, within the next week or so. Plus, the North Bay gig are having a paella party. Um, so, um, you know, head up there, and uh, I, I'm, I'm busy that day, which I, it sucks. But uh, yeah, up in uh, up in Santa Rosa, wine country, go up, stay for the night, whatever. And then shortly after that, has anyone heard of uh, uh, Captivate, Adobe Captivate? Yeah. A chance to, to learn Adobe Captivate. If you want to go and do a one-day class in Adobe Captivate, they're really hard to find. Most of them, they take two days to teach it. They charge between 600 and 1,200 bucks for a two-day class. And who knows who the teacher's going to be? There's a guy called Captivate Joe, as he's known, Joe Gansey. Yeah. Uh, anyone heard of the e-learning guild? Yeah? There are, there are three people who have now been named as e-learning guild masters, and Joe was the second person ever to be named as an e-learning guild master. And he's going to be coming and doing a one-day workshop on Captivate, and with the price of that, you could do that if you're a member, for like $209 uh, as an early bird if you're a chapter member. That, that's, that's pretty impossible to get $200 for a one-day Captivate class anywhere. That uh, you've got about, I think, four or five days left to get that early bird rate. Right? Um, anyone know about HTML5? Been hearing, been hearing about that? Yeah. Uh, Joe actually teaches also for ASTD uh, a week's, uh, like a, a, an <coughs> online class about what you need to know about HTML, HTML5. Not the general big picture about how to become an HTML5 programmer, but what you need to know as a learning pro about HTML5 and what's coming down the road. And he's doing that as an evening pro program for us on the 11th of, uh, sorry, on the 10th, on the, the evening after his show, after his performance, uh, after his uh, workshop. And that's just, that's the end of our summer of e-learning. And then the rest of the stuff that we've got um, is some really, gosh, there's more stuff coming. We have a happy hour that's going to be coming in September as well. We're one of the only gigs that actually has a happy hour. So we'll be posting that uh, for September. We'll let you know the date. It'll probably be the end of September. So I've been to the happy hours. For <laughs> so be, keep going with the gig. Keep coming to the gig events. Head up to San Francisco every so often. See those uh, for a lot of our monthly meetings. If you can't make them on, the, if you can't make up to San Francisco, if you're a member, you can get free access to the video streaming of it and see it live as it's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you.
right, thank you everyone.